joining us today. My name is Ken Levinson. I'm the executive director of WIDA. We're pleased to have so many of you here. We actually just announced this event less than two weeks ago, so to get a full room on such uh, short notice is a great testimony to the amazing panel we've put together today. Uh, thank you all for joining us and for being here today. Um, this is going to be uh, the first of uh, a series we hope to do on loosely called digital trade um, because we're going to be talking about uh, one aspect of that today, but we're going to be talking about other issues, uh, some of the platform type issues, as well as uh, e-commerce and uh, digital and uh, digitally enabled manufacturing and future events this year. Hope to do one per quarter at least. So thank you for joining us today for, for this kickoff event. We uh, at WIDA, um, about just a little, it was about two years ago, we started a project called Next Gen Trade to look at some of the future-centric trade issues. Uh, that We did that uh, about six weeks before the election of 2016. We thought, let's start talking about the future of trade. The election happened, trade policy got shifted, and we started addressing some of the issues that are on the Trump administration's agenda and haven't had a chance as much to focus on some of this. I was joking with Robert Holliman that we had him here on a digital trade event. He reminded me uh, three years ago, so be an interesting update, Robert, for that. Uh, we have a number of events coming up. Next week, we're hosting an event to look at uh, trade in the Asia-Pacific. Uh, we have two panels, an embassy panel and an industry panel. Uh, Doug Bell, who recently left the administration, has joined us today. He's going to be one of our, our moderators for the event next week. Thank you for doing that. We're going to be hosting our annual Congressional Trade Councils event on March 1st. Uh, that's where the four trade councils from Ways and Means and Finance uh, have an off-the-record discussion. Apologies for the press that's here that we can't uh, have that one on the record. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, trade with Japan later. Uh, we have that scheduled. That's on the WIDA website, as well as a conversation with Senator Pat Toomey, who has uh, legislation he's recently introduced related to Section 232 and other issues. Uh, so that's coming up in March. Uh, take a look at our website, www.weda.org slash events, and you can find all that information, as well as trade community events. So if you're at an organization that puts on events and wants to get the word out about those events, let us know, and we're happy to put that on our events calendar. With that, we're going to turn this over to our panel discussions. Thank you to Lisa Perlman for joining us as a moderator today, and to all our panelists. We're very grateful to have you there, have you here, excuse me. And it should be on, Lisa? Yes. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we have a great set of panelists today. There are bios in your programs, but briefly we've got um, Ambassador Holliman, who is now at Crowell and Mooring. We have Josh Meltzer from Brookings, Steve Stewart from IBM, and Joe Whitlock from BSA. Um, so let's just get started. Um, I want to start for one second by just level setting for this discussion on what we mean when we say digital trade. Um, and basically, for today's purposes, we mean everything. Um, <laughs> there are a set of evolving digital services that themselves are really interesting and in being traded, e-commerce marketplace platforms, electronic payment services, software and apps that allow for virtual collaboration, multi-party communication. So that's one aspect of, of a set of services that are themselves digital services that are being traded. But digitalization itself is present in almost all trade and investment that's happening today. All manufacturing and services sectors, businesses of all sizes. Uh, it's really hard to think of a business that doesn't use digital tools to find their customers, to complete their transactions, to manage their global operations, uh, or to develop their products and services. So our discussion here is going to be about the trade conditions and the rules that can facilitate the development and the deployment of these technologies in global trade. So with that, I thought we'd turn to Ambassador Holliman to set the scene for us. Um, you'll recall that as USTR was engaging in the TPP negotiation, um, there was a recognition, a broad recognition, that certain types of services and certain modes of trade um, were not so clearly covered in the existing trade rules. Um, Ambassador Holliman was at the center of that conversation, and so maybe you can start by reviewing for us the state of play at the time of the negotiation, what you were hearing from industry, um, and the types of rules that were being developed to address those concerns, and then bring us up today to today. How have government measures evolved, and how have the negotiations evolved? Thank you very much, uh, Lisa and Ken. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be back here uh, discussing these issues. 
Uh, I see a lot of my former uh, colleagues from USTR and, uh, and, the, and the US government uh, in the room, and I just want to say that none of the progress we would have made, this was such a great collective effort, and sort of the awareness of the importance of digital trade uh, is due to the great input and the accomplishments of, of so many of my counterparts in government. Uh, when we were here um, in April of uh, 2016 talking about digital trade, I think I had just put out um, our summary of the digital dozen, and I appreciate that uh, we uh, use that as a reference today. We ended up with a digital two dozen uh, by the time we're finished. Uh, and as I think we, you know, now I think in the context of the um, completion of the USMCA, uh, we probably have the equivalent of the, you know, the digital um, 28. Um, and so the numbers uh, keep growing. But I think that really shows the evolution to Lisa's question of how this has evolved over the years. Um, it's certainly one of the most rapidly, if not the most rapidly area of developing uh, policy. It's a highly competitive policy landscape. Uh, and that policy landscape is to fill in gaps that um, are arising and deal with barriers. And there are competing visions in the world for how we deal with digital trade, and it's one we um, get, have to get right uh, because the rules are still being written. The TPP, at the time it was concluded, was the most um, progressive advanced agreement around digital trade, all, although called e-commerce at the time, but digital trade uh, that had been in place in the world. It still is the most advanced uh, in the world that's actually in effect. The USMCA um, goes beyond that, but it's not yet in effect. So the seven countries who have put the CPTPP in effect have now set the highest standard that's in place in any existing trade agreement that's in force. I think the US, Canada, and Mexico recognize the opportunity to rise above that and to strengthen it. So a couple of things I'll say as we do this level setting, and you know, of course, I'm glad to have uh, my former U.S. Air colleague Joe Whitlock here, and uh, great to have him at BSA, the Software Alliance, where we worked, and certainly in my two decades there, worked to try to address emerging barriers. Um, so what I think I would say is the status now is the um, TPP, CPTPP, um, you know, had key provisions around free and open internet, around consumer choice, um, prohibiting customs uh, duties on digital products, preventing data localization, cross-border data flows, protecting source code, cybersecurity references, global standards, and interoperability is for level setting. The US, Canada, Mexico agreement, the USMCA, goes beyond that in a TPP plus which is how I would describe it. There are really key improvements. Um, for example, start by the name of digital trade. Um, I think e-commerce, um, again, uh, we, it was an evolving term. People knew the word e-commerce. When we put it into the TPP, it was clearly broader than e-commerce, but the default name we were using was e-commerce. Now it's correctly called digital trade. Uh, and I'm also saying I'm hopeful that in 20 years that future trade agreements, quite frankly, won't even need to say digital trade because to Lisa's point, it will be everything. It will be digital transformation. It'll be an inherent part of what's there. Um, so the new agreement, um, I think, has several important features. One of the most important is it explicitly enshrines the APEC cross-border privacy rules, the CBPRs, as a valid mechanism for data transfer between the parties. And I'll talk about that in a few moments, but that was a huge step forward, both in terms of that agreement, but in terms of the precedent it sets for how the US looks at open, flexible approaches to protecting privacy and allowing data to transfer. It provided a safe harbor for internet platform companies from civil liability for user-generated uh, content. Um, this really, um, bottled Section 230 of the U.S. Communications Decency Act. It was one of the things that was 
already being discussed. Uh, but quite frankly, um, it was sort of a bridge too far when we were doing the original TPP uh, because there still needed to be an agreement of how to do it. That was originally struck when, when certainly I was at USTR, my colleagues, and we were putting it into the discussions of the TISA negotiations. But now we see it in a trade agreement, which is great. The provisions favoring open government data, um, stronger commitments to online consumer protection. Uh, so those are some of the, the, the real advances that I see in um, the USMCA. And I'll say it also enshrined uh, the good work that Doug Bell and others did around um, financial services and data flows and really took the agreements and principle that had been reached in the Obama administration and enshrined those into uh, the language of the USMCA. So what are the challenges and, and sort of I'll move on um, and let us get to the rest of the panel. There, I think globally they're about data localization. Um, how do we distinguish between how we protect citizens and protect personal information? There are, in privacy, very fundamental different approaches with the EU and the GDPR. Um, starting with their view that privacy is a fundamental human right. And while many of us might agree with that in concept, we also know there are many countries in the world who do not view that. And so part of this is how do you close the gap between different underpinnings for how you view privacy still accomplishing what we want to do and need to do, which is ensure more integrity of online data transfers. Uh, in our q and I'm happy to get a little more into the ATAC privacy framework. Um, again, I think that's a huge opportunity, uh, and I know that this language in the USMCA uh, is helping to begin to level a playing field. Um, and finally, let me just say on that that um, I think there has to be interoperability around how we have different regimes for protecting data through cross-border data transfers, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the EU GDPR, the TPP countries, the USMCA. We're not going to have an identical standard, but we need interoperable ones. A um, lot of other work going on in OECD, G20, APAC, um, which I'm happy to come back to. But finally, what I think was one of the most uh, provocative and interesting statements was Prime Minister Abe of Japan at Davos, who gave a speech where, to the best of my recollection, it's the first time any leader of a country has, a sizable country, has devoted some of their, their leadership globally around the issue of data. Um, you know, I just don't think that's happened in most places. And while there are a lot of details to be fleshed out, one of the ones that really struck me in, D in Abe's speech where is after talking about the need to ensure privacy and, um, and national security, he said, we must use the free flow of medical, industrial, traffic, and most other useful, non-personal, anonymous data to see no borders and he said, repeat, no borders. And I thought what he did in that, particularly when he talked about things like medical data, he was actually talking about things that are oftentimes viewed as pretty much off limits when you talk about cross-border data transfers, but he was charging us to do that. So um, quick summary, and uh, at least I'll turn this back to you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Um, I think that's right. As the panel goes on, we're going to find that one of the biggest challenges um, people are facing today working on these digital trade issues is how to manage the question of what are restrictions look like and what do um, what do mechanisms for enabling the flow of data look like. But before we dive into that um, from the a drafting perspective, let's start, jump over to Steve. Um, I'm wondering, I think now, let's sort of start by taking a step back and looking from a business perspective. Um, from the perspective of industry, what why do digital trade activities matter? What is it that digital trade and digital technologies enable companies to do? Why is this something that we want to happen? Um, and given those operational realities, if you could talk about those, what are the priority tasks that that sort of sets then for our negotiators? Well, first I'd say digital trade matters because as Lisa said, it's everything. Um, and if it's not now, it will be um, looking forward. I, I think um, everybody pretty much has a smartphone and you're all familiar with apps, social media, video and music streaming, uh, online shopping, uh, all that's based on data flows, though it may not be cross-border data flows. 
uh, in a trade perspective. But if you look at it from a business perspective, data is the lifeblood of the global economy. You can't have a global business operate without data flows. It doesn't matter if it's manufacturing, producing anything from apparel to advanced information technology, to services, financial services, insurance, transportation, retail both online and brick and mortar retail, um, professional services, and communications and cloud services. All of those, if you're operating on a global basis, you're moving data back and forth. And if governments restrict that data or require data localization, either the business can't operate or it's much less efficient um, and less competitive. So these issues really matter. <coughs> If you um, think about IBM as an example of this, IBM operates in over 170 countries. We serve clients around the world, across all sec uh, sectors of the economy. We get two-thirds of our revenue from outside of the United States, so trade matters to IBM. Um, we're, we describe ourselves now as uh, IBM as a cloud and cognitive solutions or AI solutions company. And basically that means we're working with data. Our, our growth is based on cloud and blockchain and data analytics. Um, our, our whole business is built around protecting our customers' data, moving it, processing it for them. And if we don't have their trust, we don't have the business. So we think of trust and responsible data stewardship as absolutely essential. And we can't be successful with that, and you can't have digital trade without that trust. So part of um, what we're trying to do in business is to help governments understand how to protect that data, how that um, how data can flow while um, protecting the data, ensuring you get security. A, a couple of examples of um, IBM as a, uh, a provider of these services, and again, I, I stress that. We serve clients across all sectors of the economy, so um, manufacturing services, everything. But if you look at IBM as an example, we're a manufacturer, we have a global supply chain. We can't operate that supply chain without moving data back and forth. We provide cloud services to clients um, in different sectors. Financial services is our largest single sector. We actually process 87% of global credit card transactions. So we're um, part of the infrastructure that runs the global financial system. Um, you can't, in a, in a global financial institution, you can't detect fraud and prevent fraud and protect their, their customers if you can't monitor the data flows that are going back and forth. And if you start to compartmentalize how financial institutions are operating country by country, you know, they're not going to see broader trends and it becomes much more difficult. Um, a great example of what IBM's doing with uh, a partner, Maersk, the largest container shipping company, in the world is we've created a partnership we launched early last year called the Trade Lens. And it's an application of blockchain to streamline shipping globally, um, allowing an automated, secure process, uh, building confidence in transactions between various parties through the supply chain and ultimately facilitating customs transactions as well, all based on this trusted, secure ledger that is blockchain. And Obviously, that doesn't work without cross-border data flows. So you can see that no matter what type of business, if you're operating globally, you, you really can't operate without data flows. If we look at what governments do potentially, we've seen examples of um, data localization requirements around the world. We've seen this in Indonesia, in Vietnam, India, China, Russia. All of that, what those um, governments are often thinking is, oh, the only way I can secure data is to store it locally. But borders don't stop hackers. That's not going to secure the data just by putting the server in your own country. We can see examples of that all the time in the press. What does matter is how you store the data, not where it's stored. So applying the latest uh, cybersecurity technology, doing monitoring of uh, transactions in real time, looking for anomalies through artificial intelligence, applying encryption, training your employees. And IBM is an example. We, uh, all employees have to take um, cybersecurity training videos uh, periodically that are updated as different threats come up because often the employee, the humans, are the weakest link in the security chain. So one of the fundamental things we're looking at is how do we convince governments that data can move across 
borders, but still be secure, and we can still ensure this, the, um, the privacy of that data. So we think through right applications of technology and smart regulation, precision regulation, we can do a better job of doing that. Um, if I look at the WTO, which is probably the biggest thing going right now in terms of e-commerce discussions potentially, we just had at Davos this uh, intention to launch negotiations sometime this year, we presume. Uh, no date specifically was given. That's a great opportunity, but it's a very broad-based group of countries that is negotiating. There's 76 countries signed up to this, so uh, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, it's got everybody from the U.S. and former TPP partners to China and European Union, and lots of these countries look at data flows differently. But it's really important that these negotiations include uh, cross-border data flow provisions and data localization provisions. Um, some countries seem to want to limit this maybe just to uh, e-commerce, trade facilitation, uh, online ordering of physical goods, and facilitating the delivery of those. We think it's important that the data issues be included, even though we know it's going to be challenging, because it's so important for the, the future of the economy. And I'll, I'll just close and pass it on to the next speaker. Um, Robert, in, in his intro, talked about the difference between e-commerce and digital trade, saying we've got the, the title right in the USMCA chapter. And I couldn't agree more. I think e-commerce often has a connotation that it's just the um, cross-border delivery of goods facilitated by the internet. And that's certainly important. That, that should be a part of these negotiations. But it must be more than that. And when we look at that, the WTO calls this an e-commerce initiative. We think that's a brand new problem, frankly, because I think it makes people think um, too small about, about the issues. We'd like to see this called an International Digital Economy Agreement, or an IDEA, if you look at the, the big idea, if you look at the acronym. It's, I think, helpful to get people thinking beyond just the physical goods of e-commerce and really focus on the importance of data flows to all businesses. Thanks. That's great. Thank you.